the part two of our mini series, and we're looking at the black horse, the black horse, the third seal. I'm reading from the book of Revelation, chapter six, the book of Revelation, chapter six, please. Will you look with me to Revelation six, verse five? And when he had broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, come. And I looked and behold, the black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not harm the oil and the wine. Now, the measuring device is called a conex, and it was just about a liquid quart, only it's using a liquid standard of measurement um, from the ancient world to measure something that <coughs> they didn't use food ounces in those days. They just used the same standard of measurement and applying it to grain. And it would be a denarius, a denarius. A denarius was approximately one day's wages. In other words, it would require one day's wages to obtain enough grain to feed one person. Let's look at some of the verses that refer to this passage. Look with me, please, to the book of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 4, verse 16. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, behold, I'm going to break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they will eat bread by weight and with anxiety, and drink water by measure and in horror. Notice the water is being apportioned. And they're eating the bread in an apportioned amount because bread and water will be scarce and they will be appalled with one another and waste away in their iniquity. I will, of course, come back to this. Look with me also, please. Back to the book of Revelation. We're looking at um, Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. And they were told that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. In other words, there's a divine protection for the 144,000, which also refers back to Ezekiel chapters 8 and 9. Look with me also, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 3. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Something to do with food producing trees, plants are going to be harmed in the coming judgment. But let's look also, please, if you will, to the book of Zechariah, chapter 6, verse 2. Zechariah, chapter 6, verse 2. With the first chariot were red horses, the second black horses, and the third white horses, red, white, and black, okay? Now, what happens here? With the black horse, or the horses pulling this chariot, you see the white horse, as well as, as, as the red horse. The indications of what these horses mean are again, of course, in Revelation chapter 6. We see that the red horse is associated with war. <laughs> 
The white horse is the horse of Antichrist. He comes counterfeiting Christ. Christ comes on a white horse in Revelation 19. Antichrist comes counterfeiting him ahead of him in Revelation 6. And then, of course, we see the black horse is the famine, the fourth horse being death. There's not an exact equivalence between Zechariah um, and, and Revelation 6, but there is a parallelism. And they need to be interpreted in light of each other, at least to a degree. Okay. So, Ezekiel tells us about the water and the grain being measured out, being apportioned. Something a little different today. What we've been trying to do is to look at the unfolding of contemporary events very carefully and prayerfully in light of biblical prophecy. We've looked at AI in its relationship to the animation of a robot, the image of the beast in Revelation 13. What I'd like to talk about today is the relationship between money and food. Money and food. The American president, Thomas Jefferson, said, paper currency is subject to abuse. It was being abused in his time, and it will be abused. And he was right. Paper currency. Paper currency says don't carry all the gold around or all the silver around. Have a certificate issued by a bank or a central bank or a government that says that there is this much gold in a vault somewhere. Here is a reserve note or a certificate saying that it represents the value of this much metal that actually exists in the control of the bank or of the government or the central bank. Throughout history, hyperinflation, as we've mentioned before, is something that preceded the destruction of democratic government and the rise of dictatorships. This was instrumental in pagan Rome, going from a republic to an, an empire, an imperial empire ruled by an emperor, where the temporary position of a dictator during a time of war became perpetuated. Okay, that is one. Uh, Napoleon was another. The Wehrmacht Germany was another. The collapse of China under Chiang Kai-shek and the rise of Mao Zedong in the aftermath of the Second World War was another. Hyperinflation tends to spend doom, spell doom. If it's not checked very quickly and carefully, it will lead to some kind of disaster. Modern Israel, back in the 1980s, had 1,100% inflation at one point. If the United States did not bail Israel out, undoubtedly the Israeli economy would have come to the point of implosion and it would have resulted in social and political chaos. There were academics in Israel at the time warning of the advent of a potential dictatorship if something did not happen, and President Heim Herzog actually warned about it. Um, that that kind of inflationary environment could result in this. Well, let's talk about the relationship between currency and food. Again, we're not prophesying. We're simply trying to understand the unfolding of contemporary events, geopolitically, strategically, and economically, in light of biblical prophecy. We know that we are in the close of the age. We know that the Lord is coming. The Jews are regathered to Israel. They're back in their ancient capital. We know that this is happening in constellation with other events, a reformation of countries in the Roman Empire. At the same time, the Jews are back in their land. At the same time, there is a major apostasy in the church. Now, there has been apostasies and 
ages, seasons of apostasy in the church, going back to the early centuries of the church, that has happened before. There were figures like Napoleon and Charlemagne who tried, and and and, and Mussolini, who Benito Mussolini, who tried to resurrect the Roman Empire. We are not saying these things have not happened before, but they've never happened before in constellation with the Jews being regathered to Israel, as the Hebrew prophets predict, as Isaiah 11 says, they'd come back a second time, and as Jesus said in Zechariah 12, in Luke 21, 24, and in Matthew 23, and so forth. <coughs> these events in the Middle East, in constellation with these other events, make it unmistakable that we are coming to the close of the age, that the Lord is indeed coming, and that there will be an advent of the Antichrist before his coming. But let's move on looking at this. When these horsemen are released, one of which will be the black horse, spelling famine. Famine. And it happens after the white horse, and it happens after the red horse. One of the things that tends to breed famine is war. War causes food shortages. War can cause starvation. Going back to the ancient world, the ancient Assyrians made war like this by siege. They surrounded Samaria, cut off the food supply, and let the people starve to death into submission in 720 BC. The same thing happened in 70 AD, as recorded by Josephus and predicted by Daniel and Jesus in 70 AD. The Romans, the Titus, they surrounded Jerusalem, cut off the food supply, and there was starvation. It became so ugly both times. It happened in 585 BC. It happened in 720 BC. But then it happened again in 70 AD. That the food shortages were so terrible, there was unspeakable forms of cannibalism. Predicted by the prophets. A pregnant woman would be surrounded, waiting to give birth. And the baby, they would there will be a food riot, literally food riots over the placenta, over the afterbirth. And then they would kill the babies to have something to eat. That is how terrible it was. There is kind of reference to this by Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations, but it's predicted in the prophets. It had happened in 720 BC, 585 BC, and in 70 AD again as recorded in Wars of the Jews by Josephus. And such things will happen again at the close of the age. The communist dictator who succeeded Haile Selassie in Ethiopia, Mangitsu, he used starvation as a military weapon against his own people against his own people. When food aid was coming into the port of Djibouti, which was quasi-French, and the, the food emergency food relief was coming into Djibouti from Europe and America, he was bombing the food lines out of Djibouti into Ethiopia. He was destroying the supply chain of food to starve his own people. Joseph Stalin used starvation against his own people, the Soviets, three times, most seriously in 1927. When food is used as a weapon, the weaponization of food. It goes back to the ancient Assyrians, but it has taken place throughout history right into the 20th and 21st centuries. The weaponization of food. Hence, we see 
the black horse following the red one. And it takes place when the Antichrist is on the scene. Now, we know ultimately, as we've already looked at in our previous studies here on Word for the Weekend, that the Antichrist and false prophet will create a, commerce, a system of commerce where without the mark of the beast, you cannot buy or sell food. Again, starvation. And we see that there will be a destruction of food-producing plants and trees. In Revelation 7, Revelation um, chapter 9, we see that. And we see there will be a food apportionment, but also a water apportionment. Let's begin with the food. Um, right now, the world is in a period of transition. China has reached its peak and has gone into decline. Even today, its stock market is in free fall. They know they're in trouble. They're not going to be what they want it to be. And what China has traditionally done, going back to the period of the warring states, is that they would use war to consolidate an artificial or to engender an artificial sense of patriotism during times of crisis internally. This happened in the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution with Mao Zedong. In 1968, the Chinese began fighting with the Russians, the Soviets, on the Armour River. Communist against communist. This has always been China's strategy even a pre-communist strategy. Well, what's happening now? China is getting more militaristic because its economy is getting in more and more trouble. The real problem, however, will always be hyperinflation, as we already looked at, followed by what that does to the price of food. That is what Revelation tells us in chapter 6. Hyperinflation will drive the food prices to become so unaffordable that it will take a day's wages to feed even one person. Now, when you understand the high birth rate in Africa and in other areas of the third world, what is going to happen? Well, we know what's going to happen. And again, wars exasperate these famine conditions and antichrist will use these things capitalize on them to consolidate power for himself to be worshipped as satan incarnate virtually in counterfeit of christ things we've talked about in previous studies again let me go back to the end of the second world war the global reserve currency in which most commodities, manufactured goods, agricultural produce are priced. When Britannia ruled the waves, that had been for about 150 years the British pound, the Bank of England. Sound as a pound was a colloquialism. Everybody wanted the pound. During the American Civil War, the Southern plantation owners tried to get their money into England. The pound. It was the pound. It was the city of London. It was not Wall Street. It was the Bank of England, not the Fed, not the European Central Bank. It was the Bank of England. At that time, part of the exchequery and controlled directly by the British government. It was not an autonomous agency as it has since become an imitation of the American Fed and of the European Central Bank. Sound as a pound. After the Second World War and the decline of empire, obviously the British pound could no longer be 
the global reserve currency. The United States had 80% of the world's gold. The continental United States was not at all affected by the war. Europe was in ruins. Britain was in ruins. Japan was in ruins. China was in ruins. Russia was in ruins. It was only the United States. The United States had a dollar with 80% of the world's gold in Fort Knox and so forth and in the Federal Reserve Bank vaults in New York. And at a place called Breton Woods in New Hampshire in the United States, in New England, there was a conference convened by the United Nations. And by international agreement, everybody agreed the gold-backed dollar would be the world reserve currency, which it remains until this day. The only thing is, certain changes have taken place since that time. Let's move forward. In the 1960s, there was tremendous corruption in the American government, certainly in the administration of Lyndon Johnson, who launched an unconstitutional, expanded an unconstitutional war with no declaration of war. He sent American forces to fight in Vietnam with their hands tied behind their backs. It generated profits for corporations, defense industries, but it put tremendous strain on the American economy. And at the same time, he was trying to switch black Americans from being Republicans or Republican voters to voting Democrat. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. The party of the abolition of slavery, the abolitionist party, the party that opposed segregation and Jim Crow, the party that always helped the blacks, the party of emancipation under Lincoln forward, were the Republicans. Blacks supported Republicans. Republicans voted 22 members of the American House of Representatives who were black before a single Democrat who was black was in the House of Representatives. And the first U.S. Senator who was black was a Republican, Edmund Brooks from Massachusetts. He ran against the Democrats. He ran against the Kennedy machine in Massachusetts of, of, of JFK's family. Johnson wanted to reverse this. He wanted the blacks to be reliant on the federal government and on liberal policies, things like food stamps and welfare, to keep the blacks voting Democrat and to take them away from voting Republican. Well, you've got to raise taxes and you've got to get the money from somewhere. Borrow it. There are three ways corrupt governments get money. High taxation, borrowing through treasury bills, bonds, and so forth. And the third <coughs> is quantitative easing, printing it. Quantitative easing, printing money, is a hidden tax. In other words, the government needs the money. They go to the central bank to get it. They borrow it from the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank or the Bank of England or wherever who print it. They print it and give it to the government as a loan. And remember, the central banks are really controlled by the international banks, not by the government or the taxpayers. Even though they operate as quasi-government institutions, they represent the interest of the banking establishment, not of the voters or the taxpayers. They're outside of the control of the, of, of the government. The Bank of England was not, but Ch Tony Blair changed that. So what happens? When you print money, the politicians spend it before its value goes down. When money is pegged to the price of gold, or sometimes silver, but mainly gold, you can only print as much as you have when you have gold. In Britain, 
they had the exchange rate mechanism. And they had a, a, a pathetic figure, Gordon Brown, who basically pilfered the gold reserves of the United Kingdom. He pilfered the gold reserves of the United Kingdom, destroyed them. What do you do now? Where do you get the money? If it's not backed by a precious metal, by a monetary commodity, a mineral commodity, precious metal, it becomes known as a fiat currency. A fiat currency. And now we have rival fiat currencies, things like Bitcoin, which are not controlled by governments, but which make governments very angry because they don't control it. So they do everything they can to try to either eradicate the fiat currencies they can't control or make them illegal. What gives it value? Nothing but the promise of a corrupt government, of politicians. And their argument is, it is the vitality of the overall economy that gives it value. Well, America began to inflate, began to print money, began to overtax. America began to borrow like crazy under Johnson. He called this the great society, guns and butter, fighting this war in Vietnam with no declaration of war. No declaration of war it was openly corrupt, totally unconstitutional. Because America's allies, including Britain, Japan, were unloading hardware in Haiphong Harbor in North Vietnam. American corporations under detente with Johnson, then with Nixon and Kissinger, were trading with Russia, Soviet Union, and China, who were in turn supplying the North Vietnamese with military hardware to kill Americans and Australians, and the South Vietnamese, and South Koreans who were fighting against the communists. If there was a declaration of war, this would have been legally treason. But there was no declaration of war. There was not going to be an invasion of North Vietnam. It was all corrupt. The CIA was involved in the heroin trade, as the French Secret Service had been earlier. The government of South Vietnam was fascist. It was not a democratic country. There were no good guys. A lot of Caucasian Americans could get university deferments or go to Canada. Not all, but the more educated and middle class Caucasian Americans could get out of it if they wanted to. Poor white people. And most black people were subject to the draft. Blacks were coming back to the black communities of America in body bags left and right. Yet they were being told this is the great society that's going to liberate the blacks. The Democratic Party has always done this to black people. Always. Manipulate them and kill them. And this continues to this day. So, this is what's happening. America gets in trouble. Other countries begin to see what Johnson has done. And then what Nixon has done with the detente, the betrayal. Nixon actually goes to China. While China is supplying the North Vietnamese. And he tries to make a deal, him and Kissinger. Look, you fight North Vietnam. So China and Vietnam would have a war when the Americans and Australians left. It was all a plan that didn't work. They created a rival that is China now. And absurdity, absurdities, Vietnam is a capitalist economy. Only nominally with the, with the communist government, but its economy is purely capitalist. 
I recall one of the times I was in, in Vietnam and I was in uh, near, near Saigon, now called Ho Chi Minh City. And I was up in uh, where the American headquarters, military headquarters have been north of Saigon. Um, Long Bin. I was in Long Bin. The building that had been the main headquarters of the American Army during the Vietnam War is now the Asia Pacific headquarters of the American multinational company, Intel. <laughs> What did you fight for? What is Vietnam? It's a country with a capitalist economy that wants to be friends with America and Australia and the West that doesn't like China, that had a war with China. What what, what, what did you have the war for and kill a million people? <coughs> what did all those American youth, 19-year-olds and 18-year-olds, come home in body bags for? Nothing, except the profits of multinational corporations and corrupt politicians that's all it's all corrupt so seeing what was happening the debt the borrowing and the printing of money you get inflation inflation is not the prices of goods going up primarily if you have Low rainfall, the price of certain food products might go up because of supply and demand. Things like that can happen, but those tend to correct themselves in normal business cycles. Real inflation, as we experience it, is not the prices going up, but the value of the currency going down. So led by France, other countries come with the U.S. dollars. Now with Brenton Woods, there were U.S. dollars and there were Euro dollars, which were just U.S. dollars circulated outside the United States. The French were coming in with the Euro dollars and buying gold. Here's your dollars, give us our gold. American gold reserves began to go down. Richard Nixon defaults on the dollar. He says, we're not going to give you gold anymore. What are they going to do? The value of the dollar is based on the dynamism of the American economy, which was in recession after the war anyway. So they've got to do things. There were two things that the Americans did. One was America's leading banker, David Rockefeller, formed something called the Trilateral Commission. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and you've heard of Bilderbergers and all these things, but he formed the Trilateral Commission. The people who were in control of Japan, Europe, Britain and the United States, Canada, were trilateralists of either political party in America. Jimmy Carter was a trilateralist. He was a member of this group of about 300 politicians and bankers. Henry Kissinger was a trilateralist. Okay, George Bush was a trilateralist, senior. The Trilateral Commission. This was to be the main Western economic powers, the forerunners of the G7 and the G8, that would be the Trilateral Commission. Most of the members of it from Europe had also been Bilderbergers, but I'm not going into conspiracy theories. The other thing that happened was the Americans made a deal with the Saudi Arabians and the Emirates, particularly Saudi Arabia and at that time, Iran, when the Shah was still in control of Iran. That instead of having euro dollars that were backed by gold, you would have petrodollars backed by oil. <laughs> 
Margaret Thatcher did a 20 billion pound arms deal or 20 billion dollars of pounds, I forget, I'm sorry, with Saudi Arabia. No cash changed hands. It was paid for in oil. The arms were bought with oil. Saudi Arabians were buying weapons with oil. At the same time, the North Sea still had an abundant amount of oil. Oil became it. Then the Saudi Arabians began to weaponize oil against Israel because of fundamentalist Islam. <coughs> causing oil shortages. And under Carter, the trilateralist, the Shah of Iran fell from power. Iran stopped supplying oil to certain countries, including Israel, which is where Israel got most of its oil. <laughs> so you've got the petrodollar now because the dollar is no longer backed by gold, but there's oil. That began to shake with OPEC, with the Yom Kippur War. And when the Shah fell from power and Ayatollah Khomeini got control of Iran. Oil became precarious. The Americans have tried to, with some success, bolster the dollar, the petrol dollar, with domestic oil production. Now the United States is the biggest oil producer. The United States produces more oil than Saudi Arabia or Venezuela or any other country. Canada had shale oil. That is helping. But the Russian ruble was also oil-backed, even though Russia also had gold. So what are we going to do now? Gold is gone. Oil is almost gone. And other countries are trying to find a way to get out of using the dollar as the world currency reserve, the world reserve currency. This would strip the United States of much of its power. As long as you have the reserve currency, it's like you can write checks and not have to cash them virtually. Um, it also gives you control over the SWIFT system. So these other countries are trying to find another way out of it. BRICS in and of itself cannot do that, the so-called BRICS. The reason is the Russian ruble is plummeted. It's worth about a penny or a little more than a penny, about one pence British since the Ukrainian war. The yuan is not an exchangeable currency. If South Africa didn't have gold domestically, the rand would be next to worthless. So forget about the BRICS. But it does show that these nations, although they do not have an alternative reserve currency, they will try to pay each other in their own currencies. For Russia, this has not worked too well. Um, nobody wants rubles. And they sell oil to China, but China doesn't want to pay in rubles. It wants to pay in one. To be the reserve currency, among other things, you need to have a big bond market. A big bond market. And these BRIC countries do not as yet. The euro has not worked out as a serious challenge to the dollar. The EU has its own problems. Germany remains in recession for two years now. France is not doing much better. Britain 
has left the EU, but it has its own major problems. And it was never in the Euro. What's going to happen? No, the one or the Rupal or the Rand or the Euro, none of these things are going to challenge the dollar as the reserve currency in the near future. But when they stop using reserve currencies and begin using local currencies, their own currencies, it shows that there's a concerted effort to ditch the dollar. This creates a problem. What did the United States do when they got rid of gold? They went for the petrodollar. What do they do now in a world where the petrodollar is becoming history? The euro didn't become the threat it was supposed to. BRICS has not yet become the threat. But it does show something. The United States, in addition to the inflation, is $34 trillion in debt. Now, as a percentage of GDP, Japan, China, other countries are no better off. In fact, China is worse in proportion to a percentage of GDP that's a, a public debt. Japan public debt is about 200% of GDP. The United States, it's nearly 130%. Um, China, it may be 360%. Nobody even knows because the Chinese government does not tell the truth. In any event, let's understand this. How then can you stay top gun? We pulled it off once. The euro didn't replace the dollar. Okay. When we went off the gold standard, we used oil. But that's going. And now there's another threat to the dollar. Albeit not yet a strong one, but it, it does show the way things are going. First of all, the United States cannot do now what it did in the aftermath of the Second World War. The United States rebuilt Western Europe with the Marshall Plan. Everything was in ruins. What Germany is, what Italy is, what France is, it's because the Americans rebuilt those countries. The United States, by the standards of history, has done terrible things like any other world empire has done, except they've not been a per se empire with imperial mercantilism. They did it by corporate colonialism, by multinationalism, corporate multinationalism. They achieved it differently. Japan only became what it is because the United States rebuilt Japan and used Japan as a manufacturing base during the Korean War. That's what really boosted Japan out of the doldrums. To stop the spread of Soviet communism, which they could have stopped at the end of World War II, but didn't because of corruption, the United States allowed Germany to rebuild and to become the economic industrial dynamo of Western Europe. You take countries, fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, and you turn them into democracies. You bring about regime change. Well, that worked for Germany. And it worked for Japan. But it hasn't worked in Muslim countries. In order... For that to work, you would have to do what MacArthur did in Japan. He demythologized the Shinto religion, that the emperor is not a god, that the ancestors are not going to fight for you and give you victory. 
he demythologized the Shinto religion. He debunked it when he wrote the, and the Americans basically drafted the Constitution of Japan, made it a democracy. Nazism, there was denazification of Germany by the Americans and British. You have to debunk their ideology and their religion. But because of the corruption of various interests, including the Bush family, and I'm not trying to be political here, they wouldn't debunk Islam. They would not debunk or demythologize Islam. Therefore, you're not going to turn Islamic countries into democracies. Just as countries like Japan and Germany became competitors of the United States, uh, you help create your own future rival. Nixon and Kissinger did this with China. They thought they could make China a democracy and a capitalist country that would side with the West against the Soviet Union and bring down the Soviet Union. That was the thinking. Anyway, the United States cannot do now what it did then. It could not rebuild a devastated world. The British were playing second fiddle, but at least they were still in the game. They still had power and influence because they were an English-speaking country. One of, one of the five eyes with the Americans, the Australians, the Canadians, New Zealand, and, and Great Britain. They spent more. The United States spent more on defending Europe and funding NATO than European countries did. Why should the United States spend more money to defend Germany from the Soviet Union than Germans spend? Or than France spends? France actually withdrew its troops from NATO and hit them back of the Americans and British. Why should the Americans pay for the defense of continental Europe? That's not going to happen again. That's why you saw last week the EU, the EU decided to appropriate 54 billion euros for Ukraine. 54 billion. Countries that were not even in NATO, like Finland and Sweden, were desperate to get into NATO. They knew they could not rely on the United States anymore. It had its own economic problems. It could not pick up the bill to defend somebody else anymore. And Donald Trump said, enough is enough. You pay your fair share or we're out of here. So, you got the situation now. How can the English-speaking nations stay on top? It doesn't matter how big your military is. If your economy is not the kingpin, you're not going to be the top gun. The Soviet Union proved that. They built and built and built tanks and tanks and tanks and invested everything in the military and lost the Cold War. Now they can't even beat the Ukraine. They're in a stalemate with the Ukraine. <coughs> Soviet Union collapsed. The CIS collapsed. The Warsaw Pact collapsed. Now Russia's having problems. So what do you do? There's no way the United States and the English-speaking democracies can stay on top. Even though the other countries have their own problems. Well, what do we do? The Bible tells us what is going to happen. 
We have the prophecy in James. The gold is going to rust, the scripture says. A non-corrosive metal will oxidize. How can that happen? How can you see a decline in the value of gold? But the epistle of James warns that this is going to happen. Well, what's more valuable than gold? What's more precious than gold? Silver. These things will not be the commodities that people are going to value. Well, what can be of more value than gold? Gold and silver had a lot, have a lot of industrial applications. That's for sure. But you can't eat them. A denarius for enough grain to feed one person. Now, we have to understand grain is not just bread and cake and biscuits and bakeries and lemon meringue pies and pizza. Grain is feeding stock for cattle, for sheep, grass. They graze. The book of Revelation tells us a destruction will come to trees. Fruit trees, apple trees, pear trees, almond trees, fig trees. And a destruction will come to grass, grazing animals. And huge grain shortages. There are some countries in the world whose food production is just about adequate to feed their own population. India faced starvation in the 1960s when the monsoon rains didn't come sufficiently. But India produces just about enough food to feed its own population, now the world's most populous country, slightly bigger than China and growing, 1.4 billion. Okay, just about. The world's most populous country doesn't really have an export surplus, but it can just about feed itself. Okay. There are countries that can export small amounts of food as well as feed themselves, but usually at a cost. The biggest one of these would be Brazil, but it does so by cutting down the Amazon forests for ranching and for agriculture, causing ecolog ecological disaster that affects not only Brazil, but along with the oceans, the Amazon are the lungs of the planet. No, Brazil can feed itself, but only at the cost of its environment. Okay. Small countries with small populations can feed themselves and even have a small surplus. The Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, they can do this. Latvia, Bulgaria, small surplus. Ethiopia can do this because of Lake Tana. And Ethiopia comes into play big time in what's going to happen in the future in the Middle East. More of that in a moment. There are countries that can feed themselves and even feed themselves with a slight surplus for export. There are countries who cannot feed themselves that are already dependent for up to 20% of their food that must be imported. Although Great Britain 
has the most efficient farms in Europe, which the EU penalized it for. Britain was actually penalized by the common agricultural policy for having more efficient farming than continental Europe. Britain cannot feed itself. It, it's a food importer. But it has ties to other countries. France can feed itself, but not by much. Italy and Greece and Spain are food importers, not huge, 10 to 20%, perhaps. China, 1.4 billion people, 15 to 20% of their food has to be imported. One currency that it's getting stronger right now is the Mexican peso. Mexico must import more than 50% of its food. And a fair percentage of the vegetable produce that comes from Mexico has to be exported to the United States for foreign exchange to keep food prices lower in America. Mexico is not doing well at all. They're a big problem. China, because of its population, is a big problem. Turkey is a big problem. The biggest Muslim country in the world, Indonesia, cannot feed itself. It's in this range of 10 to 20% reliant on imports of food. Countries where you've had war are hungry in many cases. A disaster waiting to happen is West Africa. As the population and most of the rest of the world declines, including China, the population of West Africa is exploding. And Africa is mineral rich. Not all of it, but most of it. Nigeria, over 200 million people. But it cannot feed itself. Africa would seem to be an emerging market because it has a younger population. Pakistan, a young population, but can't feed itself. The biggest blotch on the map that can't feed itself? The Middle East. The entire Arabian Peninsula, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Yemen, they can't feed themselves. They can't do it. The Muslim world is in more trouble than anyone else. Now the countries that have a surplus. Russia and Ukraine would, but they're affected by the war they're presently having. They have the steppes, called the steppes. The steppes are the Eurasian equivalent of the North American Great Plains. Wheat production. Perfect soil, perfect climate for grain. Wheat, barley, corn. The United States dominates the corn. Okay. Russia and the Ukraine are potentially grain exporters and were before the war. They still are, but not to the degree they were. Russia and Ukraine both have an incentive to stop the war in order to expand agricultural production. The only other thing that Russia has other than oil and some gold and gold But what countries dominate surplus food production? Back to the five eyes. How can the English-speaking nation stay on top? United States, Canada, Australia. The English-speaking democracies have got the rest of the world by the rote.
not with gold, not with silver, not with oil, but with something much more valuable. Food. What am I saying? Well, I'm not saying anything. I'm just reading. He broke the third seal, and I heard the third living creature saying, Come, and behold the black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not harm the oil and the wine. Later, do not harm the trees and the grass until we have sealed the 144,000. You had the euro dollar. You had the petrol dollar. The way things are shaping up, the world is heading for some form of an agra dollar. An agra dollar. How can James say gold's going to lose its value? You can't eat it. Agra dollar. Now, there are some other countries that produce a surplus that is sizable. The new president of Argentina, although he's inherited a decimated economy, a catastrophe. He's pro-American and he's pro-Israeli. Anti-communist, anti-socialist, pro-free market. Argentina produces both grain and food, uh, meat in abundance, and part of Uruguay, adjoining Uruguay. In Latin America, it's Argentina, it's the United States and Canada, and Australasia, it's Australia, not New Zealand. In Europe, it's Russia and Ukraine. But it's not just the prospect of an agra dollar. What of an aqua dollar? Remember what it says in Ezekiel and in Revelation. They measure out the food, the grain, and they measure out the water. A judgment is coming that one-third of marine life will be destroyed. I remember last time I was in China looking at how low the Yangtze River had become. You couldn't navigate sections of it. Some countries are in very serious trouble like Jordan. Water shortage is going to be a very big issue. It already is in many countries, but the worst is yet to come, including for China. Ethiopia is building three dams. You've got the White Nile and the Blue Nile coming together at Khartoum in Sudan. The Nile flows from the south to the north. The most populous Arab country is Egypt. If you've been to Egypt, you know everything, like in biblical times, is the Nile. You'll see a strip of green, a narrow strip of green on either side of the Nile, and then sand. They built the Aswan Dam and the Luxor Dam. The Aswan Dam, south of Luxor, and made Lake Nasser near Abu Simbel. These three dams will produce 
hydroelectricity for international marketing. They'll be sold internationally. The electricity will be sent by high tension lines to other countries in Africa. And it will give Ethiopia a surplus of water. What will happen to Egypt? What will happen to the Nile? China is already building dams that is reducing the water supply into the Ganges. It is affecting Bangladesh and it is affecting Eastern India already. We have the prophecies of what will happen to the Euphrates. Huge dams in Turkey that will reduce the flow of water into Mesopotamia, as it was called in the ancient world, the Fertile Crescent, the Tigris and Euphrates. The Middle East is dependent on that water. India, Bangladesh, very populous countries, are dependent on that water. Coming down from Tibet, China is making border incursions into India along the border with Tibet, and a lot of it has to do with wanting to control the water. Oh, boy. Then, when the wormwood <laughs> falls from the sky and contaminates the oceans, we're talking about what Ezekiel describes. Grain and water both. It is not speculative to see how this can very practically, very practically come about. It is not speculative at all. They'll eat bread by weight and with anxiety drink water by measure in horror. That'll be in Jerusalem, of course. Now, there was a partial fulfillment of that with the Babylonian captivity. However, the book of Revelation tells us of a similar scenario. The aqua dollar. Water will be more precious than gold. Grain will be more precious than gold. The gold will rust. It doesn't matter if BRICS countries try to accumulate gold and China and Russia try to accumulate gold from South Africa to give backing to a new currency to replace the dollar. It doesn't matter. The New Testament tells us the gold will become ultimately worthless. You can't eat it. Now, I'm not saying it will be a dollar, an agro dollar or a... Uh, aqua dollar it might be but i am saying the scriptures tell us that that is going to be the basis of exchange of determining the value of a currency it'll not be precious metals it'll be food and water now let's go a bit further Ironically, there is one country in the Middle East that has solved its water problem. The Israelis working in tandem with certain American corporations such as Motorola and with academic institutions interested in agriculture and irrigation, water engineering, such as Barilan University, the Israelis have found not a cheap way, there's no cheap way yet at least, but a cheaper way to desalinate water from the sea. 
The Israelis have built seven desalination plants. Seven, and there are others that may be planned. Israel solved its water problem. As desertification expands in the Sahel and in other places, Israel, as the scripture predicts, begins to blossom like a desert. If you've been to Israel, you've seen kibbutzes and moshavs in the, in, in the Negev growing watermelons in the desert. It's sand, and they grow in watermelons. And they're good quality watermelons and things. They export these things to markets in Europe. And the scriptures say that would happen. The water in Israel. You would think that the surrounding Muslim countries would want to make peace with Israel to solve their own ecological dilemma. Without water, there's no irrigation. It affects food production. You've got human dehydration, dehydration of farm animals. You can't do anything with it. And then with oceanic pollution, that's going to get worse, the book of Revelation tells us. No. We see what's happening. In the short term to medium term, things may not change very rapidly. They may or may not. But in the longer term, we know what's going to happen. It's not going to be about oil. It's not going to be about gold or silver or other such commodities. It's only going to be about organic commodities, ones you can eat. China, very possibly India, certainly the Middle East and the Muslim world at large, countries like Pakistan, Indonesia, the oil-rich Gulf states, Turkey. They're in big trouble. Europe will be somewhat in trouble, at least. The Muslim world will be in big trouble. Mexico will be in big trouble. China will be in big trouble. How can the English-speaking nations keep power? How? In a post-petrodollar world. With an aqua-dollar. With an aqua-dollar. This is what's happening. The New Testament tells us not only what is going to happen, but why it's happening. We should not be oblivious to these things. Whatever gold and silver precious metals are worth now, whatever oil is worth now, in the long term, it's not going to be about that. It's going to be about food and water. The most basic of necessities for life. For human life, for animal life, for any agriculture, any breeding of livestock, anything. There'll be a contamination of the Earth's water supply, Revelation tells us. Turn to Wormwood, at least the third. There will be drying up of major rivers. It'll happen. There'll be a destruction of food producing trees and grass for grazing, sheep. 
cattle, whatever. It's going to come to that. We see it taking shape. Now, look, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't have a looking glass. I don't believe in New Age crystals. I don't believe in any of those things. But I don't need a crystal ball. I don't need a looking glass. I don't need New Age crystals. I don't need any of that. And you don't need any of that. To know what's coming. The reason that we don't need any of that is we have a Bible. There's no economist, no environmental scientist, certainly no crooked politician can tell you as much as this book. In fact, the things I hear from environmentalists, at least the honest ones, the things that I hear from agronomists and economists, show me how accurate the Bible is. Watch for these things. The issues in the longer term are going to be water, water rights, food, food production. And ultimately, when God's judgment falls, it's going to be grass and trees. The dollar, the euro dollar, the petrol dollar. What of the aqua dollar? What of the aqua dollar? I don't know. I don't want to speculate about things I can't be sure of what form it's going to take. I don't know what form it's going to take. But I do know what's going to happen. Come, and I looked. Behold the black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for denarius, three quarts of barley for denarius. Do not harm the oil and wine. Do not harm the trees and the grass. Yet. Yet. But it's coming. It is coming. As in the days of Elijah, however, the faithful people of God will have flour in the, in the di dish and oil in the jar. The trees and the grass will not be harmed until the 144,000 have been anointed. And although famine is coming, and although unbelievable drought and water shortage is coming, and water contamination is coming, although those things are coming, so is Jesus. And he will keep us. If we are faithful to him, he will be faithful to us. He will preserve us from the hour of testing. This is not to be confused with the myth of pre-tribulationism. But it is to say that although those things that the scripture says are going to happen will happen and arguably have already begun to transpire, we know it ahead of time. And we know we have a God who is faithful. We need to interpret the way the world is going and understand it 
and the light of end time prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash from Oriel Ministries.